I want to thank Leslie for that over-the-top introduction, but I think I should present to you my real credentials. First of all, I'm a Texan. Whoa. Honey, you have no idea how nice it is to be in an audience where the people actually know where Beaumont, Texas is, <laughs> where I was born. I'm also disproportionately motivated. I've been speaking all over the country. I've been at Oracle and Lockheed Martin and Ernst & Young. But in this audience, for the first time for me, I have my daughter, my sister, and my college roommate. These people don't think I've got it together yet. <laughs> so I hope you tell them I'm doing a great job. The third reason I think I have something to share with you is that in all the years I worked, I learned a lot about how it is men and women behave with one another at work. And I think that's something we ought to talk about. So I consider myself an expert in that one area, but I don't consider myself an expert in all the other roles we get, mother, daughter, lover, wife. I was reminded of this recently because I was on Martha Stewart's show, and she had some entrepreneurs on that I was supposed to give advice to. And she surprised me by putting up behind her some pictures of my wedding, in which Martha was a bridesmaid. So you can imagine the, the live audience was ooing and awing about Martha, not me. And she turned to me and she said, let's see, which one of your weddings was this? I'll get her later. But I haven't mastered the other parts of our lives. I'm still on that. But I did want to write this book. You, you've heard the modest title, I'd Rather Be in Charge. A friend of mine, a guy that's very literary and lived in the magazine and publishing world, said, you missed it. You could have had a title that would give you a wild bestseller. You should have called it, I'd rather be on top. <laughs> Just like a man. <laughs> so this is my serious mission. The real title in my mind's eye of this book is, I'd rather you be in charge. I hope to provoke, maybe inspire, tempt you into taking ever larger spheres of influence. It's not an anti-man thing, I mean, men trained me, they were my best friends. It's because our companies and our countries, our country and countries all over the world, will be better off if more women are in places of influence. So my focus is on this thing. How do you assess yourself? And then how do you communicate that? There's considerable evidence that we are lousy at communicating our potential to others. Um, McKinsey has this reference that says, if, if there's a job opening and a man has two out of the 10 requirements, he says, I'll, I'll, I'll do it. And a woman won't even open her mouth till she has eight out of the 10. Just one symptom of how cautious we can be about the size of us. That's because we carry pictures of ourselves as lesser than we are. One reason we see ourselves as smaller is we think we are the work. We think if we work harder and smarter that someone will anoint us and promotions and big spots will come our way. And there's plenty of data that says it's not going to happen like that. I know about this and I care about it because for far too long I thought I was the work. So I was at J. Walter Thompson Ad Agency in Chicago and I mastered the work. I got promoted six times in five years and I thought I was hot stuff. I mean, I could do the ads, I could collaborate the people, I could do with the clients, and I decided for a lot of reasons that I would try this smaller agency where I could be the CEO. And the minute I hit there, I began to fail. It was some shock. I could do all the work, but what threw me were the, was the chaos of a small, smaller ad agency, somewhat broken, 
There was more debt than I had ever dealt with. There, there was um, a creative department that left at 4 o'clock to go with the chairman to the bar. And when you walked down the hall, all you could smell was pot. And there was this, this whole sense that the clients not only didn't like us, they were overtly hostile. Everywhere I turned, I had this deep-seated feeling that I could not do this. And I got a job offer from another big, stable, more formal university of advertising like Thompson was, and I was out the door. It wasn't as big a job as in terms of CEO, but I knew I could do it. The next morning, having tendered my resignation to my beloved chairman, I was thumbing through the reviews that they gave, we did as Proctor asked us to do to uh, rate one another anonymously. I read, Charlotte is fearless. And again I read, Charlotte defends us, she's so brave. This is the woman who's waking up at 4 a.m. every morning deeply panicked. And I thought, if these people think I am fearless, I wonder if there's not in me both of these qualities. And I think that's the way it is with us. We house fearlessness and a great deal of fear. So I stopped thinking so much about the work and started to do the homework of learning who the whole Charlotte Beers was. And I learned that we bring to work, like a suitcase on our backs, all these influences from our family and deep-seated traits that cause us to act a certain way, especially when the relationships are tricky and things are going rough. So for instance, I was disproportionately panicked about the drug use and all the problems there because my family, my father was an alcoholic. And I knew that a lot of drinking could escalate to violence. And I became a five-year-old again when I saw that happening. Debt was the same problem. The senior officers weren't worried about the debt. I was hysterical. Because in my family, financial instability was pretty common. Slowly but surely, I began to study this Charlotte. I kept a journal. I recommend it to you. I watched myself as I responded and reacted. I watched when fear rose up in me. I went to adult children of alcoholics. And sooner than I could ever hope, my whole view changed from seeing myself as someone who was panicking and ruined to someone who said, hey, they gave us an ad agency to reinvent. And you know, we did that. We brought in young women. That was the first era where so many, and you know, who wouldn't want to work with a bunch of beautiful women, eager, smarter? And we became very famous agency in a fairly short period of time. Now just think what would have happened to my career at that crossroads if I had taken the first assessment of myself. I'm panicked, I can't do it. I worry about you doing that when the going gets rough. I worry about you not knowing who you are and how to see things from a different point of view in terms of the size of you. I actually was forced at that period by hitting a wall to assess who I was from within and to acknowledge, which I had never done because I had my resume, right? Wasn't my resume the sum of me? To acknowledge the traits and influences that make up not just my work, but who I am. I was forced to learn of what I was made. Here's a liberating thought that was built on this experience of mine and why I teach this process of doing that inventory in the book. I don't do it because I learn from it. I do it because as I teach executive women everywhere, they use this process to great advantage. But consider this, you are not at work the person you are at home. You will find this to be very liberating. Whoever you are at home needs to stay there. You can be at work an edgier, braver, different person. You can use sides and sets of yourself that would not be called on in these other experiences. And don't you think that is part of the reason we love to work? 
Another issue is in front of you that blurs your ability to see yourself more powerfully. When women come to work, and this is still true, it's staggering to me, women are expected to be womanly. What is being womanly? Collaborative, peacekeeping, um, communal, harder working, modest. I would like to take modesty and have you leave it on the shelf at home because while you're being modest, the fellows are boasting and they're not at all worried about it. Please think about replacing womanly, which is your natural avenue and very attractive. I'd like my friends to be like that, my family. Those are beautiful qualities, but they will keep you from being promoted if you spend all your time building great teams and you never step out of the team to say, choose me. You don't have to scorch the earth to convince someone and yourself that there's a brave side of you. There are things you care strongly about and you're prepared to step up and talk about it. Now that is actually the way you begin to learn one step at a time how to lead. There was a woman in one of the executive classes who had a very powerful orientation toward being womanly. Her whole family was matriarchal. The aunts and the sisters took over the whole family. And when a young couple in the family group lost their money and were about to lose their house, the family took up the mortgage till they were back on it. Powerful and positive. So her picture of herself was a mother hen with all these chicks around which gave me a heart attack. What else is in there? She was so good, people kept expecting her to do something else. And she began to go back and do this inventory I think we need to do. And she remembered that she walked into her family's house when she was about 20 and said, I'm going around the world. I'll check in with you later. That's not much of a mother hen. She didn't show up for 18 months. She began to think about what was really riding her, what drives her, who she is, separate from this powerful family image. She was in a room, the two guys were talking about a job that had been open. They weren't even considering her. And she stepped up and in front of them and said, I'll take it. And they were so surprised they gave it to her. You know what she calls that trait? Covert bravery. I love that. I love that she discovered that about herself, and she's counting on herself to do that. That's a good example of being leaderly versus womanly. So all of this is part of you getting to hold a bigger picture of yourself in your head. The traits and influences that you take to work every day are actually more important and more influential than your highly vaunted work skills. That's why you can't know about this treasure chest. And then I'll help you think about it like this, because I love this idea. It, is, it ain't about the work, it's about your delivery system. So what is delivery? This is my word, but I think it works. Delivery is the force field around you that gets the work seen, used, and recognized. You know how much good work goes nowhere? Do you know what skill, other than your work skills, it takes to get somebody to see it, to use it, and above all, say, wow, that's good work. You need to think about your delivery system because as you move up the ladder, that's twice as important as your work skills. As managers, we sit in a room, we almost always are dealing with people who have parity skills. What we're looking for is that other ingredient of who you are, a degree of resilience, even ruthlessness, an energy. It can be a very peculiar set of traits, but we will find them. And if we don't know them, we'll guess. And that's why men choose men to get promoted, because they can guess their potential. And they don't know how to see and support the leader in you. So rather than wait for companies to change and men to wise up, you're going to have to learn how to do this yourself. You find it, and you learn to talk about it.
Delivery is how you behave, your deepest beliefs, your attitude responses. You don't weigh those enough because you get in the slipstream of work and you don't have time, you think. Get the journal, watch yourself, do your homework. I had a fascinating experience with a woman who's very close to some of you technologically sophisticated women. She's a digital expert in the world of marketing and advertising. And they, they said about her, when you walk by her office, you can see the smoke coming out of her office. She was extremely well paid and nobody knew her. She built her first portrait, brain in a jar. It was true. And I thought, well, she gets well paid. She's very respected. Do you like this portrait? And she said, I, I'm lonely here. I don't know how to, they're starting to move all around me. I'm not considered management talent. She put feet on her brain in the jar and started taking her show on the road. That wasn't easy for her to do. She had to learn something about communicating, which we're going to talk about in a minute. When I had to dis assess my delivery system in that uh, wall I hit, I found out that I have some driving traits. And the thing about these traits that I discovered is that if they're big and important in you, they're both positive and negative. So my personal driving trait since the fifth grade is all things being equal, I'd rather be in charge. Now, when you have a big decision to make and you've got something broken, that's a good trait. If everything's going well, you do not want me on the premises. So you see how important it is to understand what is it that happens to you when you just have to do it. My other trait was inherited from the family, and I think we do that. I think we have our own, I think we have the family. My family passed along an almost lethal form of impatience. Now you take these two traits, you will not want to marry this woman. <laughs> what? But some people did. <laughs> so now I had to build a portrait of myself. I had to recognize the good, the bad, and the ugly. I'm going to go through this fast, but I urge you to say, what is the image of myself I'm carrying? Because you convey that every day to somebody. So I wanted to get the highest possible portrait, not the one I was living with. And I found in George Bernard Shaw some words that inspired me. He talked about being a force of nature. That really turned me on. I want to make a difference. Toward a mighty task. I don't want any small assignments. I didn't always accomplish that. And then I remembered the other aspect of who I wanted to be. I met a young woman on a vacation once. I didn't talk to her. She was up on a hill and she was on a horse and her hands were holding the reins. And on her wrist were these two brilliantly colored bracelets that the light was glinting off of them. And I said to her, what are they? And she said, my father gave them to me. They're for strength. And I don't know why, but something stayed with me about that. So whatever your portrait is, and I've learned now how beautifully some women can catch their portrait and how some of us just keep struggling. One day you will need to know what is the highest form of who you can be. It's not necessarily where you are today. So now we're very successful at Tatham. I'm quite full of myself, and uh, me and my horse are out. And we get this huge beer account, and to my surprise, the big head of the division asked me to meet him in New York for a drink and discuss the account. Now, he normally wouldn't see ad agency people, so I thought it was because we're so remarkable. I went to New York, and as soon as I walked in the 21 Club, I thought, there are a lot of guys drinking with him. He turned and looked at me and said, look, let's go to dinner. Why don't you get rid of your car? You can use, we can use mine. But I'm from Texas. I always have an exit plan. <laughs> so I went to my driver and said, follow us. So on the way over, he said, oh, I forgot the papers. What papers? He said, why don't we stop at the Helmsley? You should see our beautiful new company apartment. 
All I could think is how much the guys back at Chicago would love to hear about this swanky new apartment. So we get in this private elevator, private, and I realize this man's had a lot to drink. He is swaying. Now you know this is not my long suit, so I'm already panicked. We get up to the room, the elevator closes, you would wonder if it was ever there. It's very dark. He said, let me show you around. He puts these hands on me. He walks me in this room. I stumble and fall over into a bed, and he is on top of me. In less than 45 minutes, I have a client on top of me I have never met. What would you do? I'll tell you what you do. You immediately realize that no one would believe you did this innocently. You immediately realize he is a lot stronger than you are, and true, true panic sets in. And while we were strong, struggling there, I just got this picture of the woman on the horse. I really did. I thought, wait a minute. We have worked so hard for so many years to get to our place in the company. I am not going to be this Neanderthal's victim. I found my voice and I said, Howard, you don't want to do this. And I gave him a mighty shove. To my surprise, he just rolled off and went over to the side of the bed. I leaped up, found the elevator. On the way out the door, I heard him sobbing. Very strange. But that wasn't the problem. The problem was tomorrow morning when Howard would realize that I could nail him and we would lose his business for one reason or another. And I had decided after talking with my buddies who thought punching him out would be a good idea, <laughs> that I have to take care of it. Now you learn something about who you are. I remember my finger trembling and I said, I, I had his phone number. I called him at 6.30. Howard, you were not yourself last night. And he is ooing and aahing, and I say, I, I can't work with you, but I'm going to put a new team on this, and I expect it to go very well. And he said, uh, yes. And I said, and Howard, we'll never refer to this again. And he said, thank you. And you might have handled it differently. I know that it was within me that way to handle it. So the reason I tell you this story is I, ho I hope you don't run across such a soap opera. I stay away from the 21 Club <laughs> or the Helmsley. But I want you to realize that you will one day cross a threshold. Try to remember these exact words, where the relationships overwhelm the work. My example is quite exaggerated. The day I went to Tatham, the work didn't matter. The relationships were a mess. This is very important to see because women say to me they don't like politics. Politics are messy relationships. You got to get in the game. You can't step aside till everybody becomes nice again. They get messy going up the ladder. Order succumbs to chaos. Loyal teams are replaced that you built and loved by hostile ones because why? Because you're making changes. You're trying to make something happen. You're trying to fix that which is broken. And you're no longer adored and popular. You're in charge. This is not easy. You have to figure out how you are going to find your way to difficult, challenging relationships and not do it like the men do it because you have to do it your own way. I don't know a man who would answer, well, actually, no man would be there. I guess that's not relevant. In order to handle these more challenging relationships, you need two things. It's not such a bad list. You need to know who you are. That's the part we, we started with. You can't get anywhere without it. And you also need to know how to be an artful communicator. You can learn this skill. I had to learn it. Everybody I've ever met has had to go through that tunnel of learning how to be more masterful in their communication. What does it sound like when you're being artfully clear communicator? You're speaking with clarity from the center of yourself. You're clear. 
You are speaking in a memorable way because you've acquired the skills to do it. You're poetic, you're, visu you're visual. When I said, Howard, you were not yourself last night, there was a whole world of communication behind that. It took me an hour to choose that opening sentence. I think it was dead on. I flagged to Howard right then, you're not going to be in trouble if you behave. And then I asked for a quid pro quo. I assume the account will go well. No one ever leads without learning to speak clearly, memorably, and going overtly for persuasion. This is harder for us women. We would like to let the facts speak for us. The report indicates. It's particularly difficult if you're in the sophisticated tech world because you can prove a lot of things. But the things that matter, that influence, persuade, and move people are never provable. What are you going to use? You're going to use your ability to believe, to be so articulate, to be in such a center of what you need to have happen that you turn around and people are following you. That is called leadership. How do you get there? You practice it every single day. You just keep putting your foot in your mouth. I did it for years. But let me give you an example of watching for a time when you nailed it. When I was a young account executive at J. Walter Thompson, I was from Texas, and there was only one other woman. She was senior to me, brilliant, beautiful, scary. She had a wicked tongue. She was in the creative department. I walked down the hall one day, and I heard the men roaring, and Marion was doing a spectacular mockery of my Texas accent. I think it's the right thing to do, is about how it sounded. I went beet red in the hall. I, I could not speak. After that, I wondered how foolishly I sounded. And I realized, after a couple of weeks, I am never going to make it in advertising if I can't talk. So it wasn't bravery, it was desperation that took me to her office. I walked in, I shut the door. She looked up and frowned at me, and she was fierce. I said to her, I'm not leaving here until you and I unite as women so that we do not allow the men to divide and diminish us. And she said, what are you doing for lunch? Took me out and taught me to drink scotch mist, <laughs> which sent me right home. But you know what was great? We were friends forever. Now, I want to think about that story partly because for one time in my early career, I was clear, memorable, and overtly persuasive. And I want you to notice that walking in and shutting the door was part of the communication. But the other thing that's come up as, as I speak all over the country is we need to learn to teach, defend, and honor one another at work, like I ask Marion to do. Because every single place I go, women tell me that other women are harsh, manipulative, sneaky, difficult. We have to turn to those women and say, knock it off. This is another way to be. It's not pleasant. It's necessary. We can be better defenders of one another. Now, there's another point I want to assure you. You don't have to be a, born a great communicator to be an artful one. When Colin Powell was driving with his wife, Alma, from New York City to Fort Bragg, he couldn't even use the restrooms along the way. And yet this man has become an amazingly eloquent and revered spokesperson. He taught himself, day at a time. When he went to Germany as a soldier, he learned German. He kept saying, I'm going to be a good communicator. You need to do that. You need to do whatever it takes. At Davos, which is an economic forum you've probably all heard about, Powell was speaking when we were right between Afghanistan and Iraq. We were not popular. And there was a world audience there, academics, professors, moguls. And Powell gave his Secretary of State speech, and there was very modest applause. A deliberately tough question was asked. Why does the United States always turn to hard power, meaning military, versus soft power, which is diplomacy and programs? 
It's a good question. I was asking it myself, and I was in the government. But here's what happened. Powell stepped out of his temporary portrait as a Secretary of State, and he stepped into his life portrait as a soldier. And he said, it was not soft power that saved Europe when we sent young American men and women to die. Not once did we ask for treasure or gain. All we asked for was enough land to bury them on. A friend of mine, a venture capitalist, was there, and he said, you could physically feel the temperature change in the room. And before Powell sat down, there was an ovation. You can transform the reception you get in complex, skeptical, and difficult audiences if you can speak from the center of who you are about something you believe greatly, and then you become a powerful communicator. I'm going to close with one of the most challenging times I ever had, and I'm going to ask you, what would you do? Because when you have done all this homework, you know who you are and you learn how to speak, you'll be tested like this. I was at Ogilvy, I was the outside chairman and CEO. I was parachuted in to fix quite a broken agency. You can see with my traits and attitude, I was a good change agent. So I knew who I was, I knew what I was going there for, that helped a lot. I'd been there nine months, it wasn't going too well. And a guy who, who and um, I was trying to sell a vision for the company that had just begun to come together. A small group believed in it, but a lot didn't. 253 offices, 8,000 people, we had to get going. And my worry was we would never knit these fiefdoms back together. Business Week had just published an article wondering if Charlotte Beers was over her head. Very helpful. <laughs> an ally, a friend of mine, came to me and said, my God, there's a group of senior officers planning to oust you. You have to do something. You have to show them who's boss. Well, I was just leaving for the first vacation I'd had in all those nine months, and I said, I'll call you. Well, of course, I was in Aspen. I didn't think about anything else. And through the night in the Rockies, I did an examination of who I was. I found the crux of the problem and I reached a conclusion about what to do. First of all, I was so hurt about this betrayal that it took me a lot of time to say, you know what, this is not personal. They don't like this idea. They probably don't like me. I can't do anything about that. Now, how good is this idea? Because these tests make us ask ourselves, have we even been thinking well? I went through all the reasons, the arguments, stuff I'd done many times. I finally realized something very nice. I don't have another idea. I'm going to back it. It's very helpful to get to that point of no return. And the other thing that was most important to me was when I thought about continuing to sell the idea of brand stewardship, which was the vision, my energy soared. When I thought about taking on the evil cabal, as I call them, my energy fell to the floor, and I thought, that's it. I personally don't have the energy to start worrying about these guys. There were things I could have done. I did call them my ally back, and I just horrified him. I said, don't even tell me who they are. At this point, I will do nothing. Well, he thought I was cooked. But I knew something about being cooked. I knew that if we succeeded in brand stewardship, they were cooked. And if I didn't, I was out anyway. It's simple. So we, we actually did a good job. We won IBM, the largest account change in history in advertising. And I brought the ringleader, whom I now have identified, into my office and gave him a proposition he could not refuse. I don't know a single man whom I like and respect who would have handled the evil cabal, the mutiny, that way. You need to think about what you would do, what would come naturally out of your instincts,
your responses, the way you treat people, the way you see yourself. You see, it's complex. You need to be in charge on your terms, but you don't need a lobotomy. You don't need to become someone you're not. You need to know the stranger within. You need to locate where in you is that fierce resolve, that intense belief, a calm refusal to yield, if necessary, and you need to become the articulate, crystal clear spokesperson you were meant to be. You will have such challenges. After all, we are women. We will be tested. I want you ready. Thank you.